wow, how can you not talk about education in a compelling way? How can you not talk about it in an emotional way? How can you not build relationships? I mean, everyone feels something in their heart about education. Hi, I'm Susie Martinelli, host of the Girls in Tech podcast, where we're discussing the ways tech is always evolving across every industry while helping the world evolve too. Listen in, get inspired, and learn how you can use your skills to create the change you want to see in the world. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Girls in Tech podcast. Today, we have Asha Choksi, VP of Insights, Strategy, and Innovation at Pearson. And we're going to talk about how education is being drastically shifted by technology and by what's happened the last year. Welcome. Welcome, Asha. Thank you so much, Susie. I'm so excited to be here. Yes. uh, Thank you for having this super important conversation with us. We hear about it every day in the news. So we appreciate you giving us your time and and telling us what is happening on the tech ed side of things. So please, let's start with your, your role at Pearson. Tell us about your role and how innovation and strategy intersect, because that's a really fascinating combination. Sure. And just a little bit of background about Pearson. Um, So we're a global learning company with the incredible mission of helping people achieve their potential through learning. So we do a lot of that by providing digital content and learning experiences. So usually in partnership with universities, as well as assessments and qualifications. So with that out of the way, my current role, I lead up the Insights Strategy Innovation Team for Virtual Learning. So what that means is my team is responsible for continually looking at trends in the market, everything from like what kinds of devices are young people using to employment trends to changing demographics and preferences of students. And basically, we take that information and we use it to develop our strategy in terms of, you know, what kind of products and services we need to offer next, or maybe how we might need to shift our direction of travel. You know, there's been a lot going on in this last year, and we've had to really look very closely at our business and what's going on in the market and adjust. And then, you know, to take it one step further, we, of course, think about product innovation. So we experiment with different ways we can deliver on student needs in the future. And again, as you can imagine, with all that's going on in the world with online learning, it's an incredible time to be in this space. Yes, absolutely. There's so much work to do. Um, You know, if, if we had to choose an industry that COVID had changed the most, I would bet on education. And your focus is particularly on higher education. Can you walk us through the good and the challenging place we are today? Sure. So, you know, COVID has really pushed everyone in our ecosystem, you know, what we call the educational ecosystem, to think really critically about how we're serving the greater good and where we're falling short, to be honest. You know, for years, students have been questioning the value of college, uh, especially with how expensive it's become. And they also felt that universities were a bit out of touch not necessarily offering the kind of experiences that most of us are used to in our day-to-day, giving us these sort of seamless bridges between online and in-person, you know, when it comes to bringing tech into the classroom. And, you know, this all came to a head, as we all know, this past year when we had to rush into virtual learning, which really wasn't the ideal experience. I mean, it served its purpose, but I think all of us realize that we need to invest in creating truly digital, immersive, consumer-grade experiences. I mean, we already expect it in all other walks of life, so education really shouldn't be any different. It should be very intuitive. The other thing that what COVID has really brought to the forefront is this need for lifelong learning and, you know, micro-credentialing, so something, some options to full-blown degrees. Again, we'd already seen a lot of this starting to happen. Tech disruption, automation kind of meant that a lot of people have had to reskill pretty regularly in their lives. You know, it wasn't like they could just have a degree and be done. They had to really continually reinvent themselves. And, you know, this has especially come to the forefront because we know that to a certain extent, a lot of people aren't going to return to offices. You know, we're going to continue to work remotely. And because of that, people are going to have to learn a lot of these sort of traditional soft skills online, and they're going to need to know how to do these things online. So just like you and I are having this conversation remotely, people are going to need to learn how to build relationships, you know, collaborate, manage teams, persuade, communicate online. And so that requires sort of a new, new methods of learning and new ways of learning. So again, nothing's insurmountable, but it presents a great opportunity for online learning, which we feel like 
really fits in with the need of people who are later in their careers and, you know, have to kind of fit it in with the rest of their life. So on that note, is online learning better suited for some personalities over others? I'd love to know how, how technology is helping with retention and community. Yeah, of course. You know, that's, that's a big question, right? For everyone, I think, especially given this past year where people have felt very isolated to a certain extent. And what's interesting is a lot of sort of, you know, when we think about innovation and looking to the future, we often look at young people as sort of an indicator of what we think we might expect. And what's interesting is we did some ethnographies a few years ago with students, high school students, actually, to really understand how they were learning. You know, a big part of our business is the textbook business. And we were like, well, are they even using textbooks? You know, how are they learning? How are they studying? You know, what, what's happening? And so we literally went into their bedrooms and, and we talked to them and we tried to understand, you know, how they're doing their homework. And it was, it was fascinating because they really did already have a sense of community online. Um, they did have connectivity to their teachers, you know, even in a brick and mortar environment. So, for example, you know, they weren't opening their physical textbooks, but if they need to find something out, you know, there was some sort of immediate gratification that they got from digging it up on YouTube or finding something online. They would connect with their peers and get information from them. Teachers were already using group text, bulletin boards, you know, shared materials, apps, videos, and all kinds of materials. So I think what we were seeing is that the world is sort of moving towards this world of remote work and we aren't really constrained by boundaries, you can actually build greater connectivity online. The challenge, of course, will be that, you know, we need to make sure that it's equitable, that everyone has equal access to technology, equal access to broadband and, and everything else that they need to be successful. And, and that's where I think the barrier has traditionally existed. You've had to have been more of a self-starter and you've had to know where to look. And I think as we be, make people more equally digitally fluent, everyone will be able to have an equal opportunity to, you know, make the most of what digital has to offer. Yeah. And unfortunately, we did see a huge drop off in, in college matriculation, you know, during and, and after COVID, not only in community colleges, which has had a huge impact in the community that attends them, but but all across higher education. How do we solve for this going forward? Yeah, there, there's so much to unpack in that question. And, you know, we really, you know, we continually monitor enrollments every year. You know, obviously this past year was a big wild card because, you know, there were numbers that projected that, you know, college enrollments were going to drop by as much as 30 to 40%. That actually didn't happen, you know, it was closer to 4%. But as you rightly mentioned, most of the drop happened in community colleges. What's important to note is that, you know, there had been this decrease, this perception of value of college education has been decreasing every year. People have been questioning, like, is it going to help me get a job for the money I'm spending on it, for the amount of time that I'm spending on it? And what it's doing now is it's driving this greater need for alternate credentials in the space. So there are, you know, if, if people are sort of the first in their families to go to college, you know, for example, they may need extra support to figure out what classes they need to take, maybe even what study methods. In some cases, you know, it is about time and flexibility, which, again, you know, online learning can help with. But in other cases, they just may need more support to kind of go through the program. The thing is with alternate credentials, what we're finding, and, you know, when I say alternate credentials, I mean things like a certificate, for example. It could be potentially a two-year degree. What we're seeing is that even employers are much more open to those as ways of bringing in new candidates. It doesn't always have to be a four-year degree. So I think when we think about solving for this sort of drop, what we really need to do is get to the root cause and figure out, like, is it about cost? Is it about flexibility? Is it about the support that these first-time college goers need to help them get through a program and lead to employment? Those are the things that we need to work on, because I think a lot of people think that it's really just about the cost of college education. And I don't think that's what it is. I think it's more around the value. Well, I love this credentialing trend that could bundle up to a degree or bundle up to what's really the latest 
technology or the latest insights that people need to learn to be in the real world, right? And lifelong learning, I feel like that in the past was something for a privileged crowd that could just go back to school, keep learning as, as a hobby or something interesting to do in addition to whatever else they were doing. But now, again, with technology, it's something that we have to do to not only keep our brains healthy, but to to stay on top of what's happening and shifting and, and making life hopefully better in society. Absolutely. So tell us, let's talk about us, you know, data and analyzing behavior, because so much of what you do uh, is analyzing this type of behavior and unexpected trends like COVID in order to shift the way people learn. How do you go about mining and and modeling these huge data sets uh, and then interpreting them into the work you do at Pearson? Sure. So if you think about even what other businesses are doing and how they're using this data they're really using it to personalize experiences, you know, and I I mentioned how education in a way is still a bit clunky. You know, we haven't really kind of cracked how can we truly personalize education so that everyone gets an opportunity to learn in a way that makes the most sense for them. But, you know, if you think about, you know, some of the products and services that we already have, when it comes to sort of online tools that you could use perhaps even in a, in a brick and mortar environment, you know, you can provide algorithms and better ways of assessing how your students are doing, which students might be struggling to allow you help you get back on track. And, and this is something that professors or even teachers at the K-12 level really need, especially right now as they're fighting for resources and having to do more with less. This allows them to really help retain students and help them through the programs that they may be encountering. And further, we think that we can use data to help us better personalize our offerings. So one of the things that we look at quite a bit is employer data. For example, if you look at like LinkedIn and you look at job postings, you can see what are the skills that are really in demand right now? What are the ones that are going to lead to employment? Because, you know, if you're thinking about being very learner centric and we're trying to help students make progress in their lives, we need to offer up the programs that are going to be the most likely to make them employable. So, for example, if we know we see patterns of data that suggest that someone three years into their career as a market researcher needs to learn Tableau, well, then we have the ability to serve it up in some shape or fashion, you know, through partnerships with universities or employers and through algorithms that help us, you know, target the right people for the right program. And what current insights and trends are you observing right now after looking at the data? Well, you mean aside from taking out a crystal ball and trying to figure out what's going to happen to education next year, which is pretty much everyone's guess. But the biggest thing that we're looking at right now is a role that employers will play in the space. So, Our CEO often talks about how employers are going to become the new university. And so we see companies like Google, LinkedIn, Facebook, IBM, you know, they're really branching out into the space in a big way. Very much, you know, the alternate credentials that I referred to earlier, but basically offering up certifications, credentials to help make people job ready. And, you know, these could be additive to a degree or they could be in replacement of a degree. What's incredibly gratifying about this whole space is how it actually improves diversity and equity within the workforce because, again, it improves access to education and employment opportunities. Even people who maybe decide that a four-year degree isn't for them, they can learn skills that are very marketable and valuable in the marketplace, and employers are increasingly open to people with those skills. So, it's really amazing to watch and we're so happy to be part of this evolution and we'll continue to watch it really closely. Yeah. You mentioned Google. I know they have a great credentialing program because they have so many jobs to fill. They essentially give people the opportunity to learn through their, you know, going to google.com and and looking at their curriculum and then apply for jobs within the Google universe. Right. Are there any other companies uh, that you feel are, are leaders right now? 
Yeah, well, Facebook is another one. You know, they've got, for example, this whole digital marketing module, you know, collection of modules where you can go through. It's like its own little university and you end up with this credential. And and if you feel like you just need to learn one little piece of it for, you know, to help you do your current job better, great. But and then if you want to learn the rest you know, you can go through the rest. And, and it's not just for getting a job at Facebook. I mean, these are very marketable skills anywhere. It's just that they're committed to sort of building this workforce because they know that everyone will benefit from a, work, a qualified workforce, not just them. So again, it, it's, it's, really, it's really great to watch this sort of ecosystem unfolding because, you know, it's really built with universities, companies like the ones we've been talking about and companies like ours because there's really no one company that can do it alone. I mean, even, even you know, in these conversations we've been having with employers, they're working really closely with the university systems and trying to build that linkage between, you know, education and employment. Well, I think partnerships between employers and universities would just be amazing. I know it's already happening, not only giving skills, but giving you know, the the pride that that a lot of people go to university for to get that degree, right? For those that that do want it. So that's, that's really exciting. What do you see, if you want to have fun and predict what's happening in the fall with higher ed? I mean, so many university students are, you know, taking time off, not because they don't want to continue learning, but because the price of higher education is, is so much, and they don't, you know, if they're just going to be doing coursework online, the value quickly disappears. What do you see happening in the fall with higher education? Yeah, well, so I think there there are two pieces. First of all, I think what we saw even last fall when the drop was not as significant as we thought, people have a desire to kind of resume normalcy. And so I think for a lot of people, even it wasn't even though it wasn't entirely a rational decision, I can speak for myself. I have freshmen in university right now, they will still spend the big money to send their kids to university just because of other reasons. Again, it's not entirely a rational transactional decision. I think what we'll see, though, within the experience and what we're hearing even from our university partners now is that they've been kind of pushed to introduce technology into the classroom and it's been accelerated and there's really no going back. So there will be some element of hybrid learning where, you know, perhaps you're either, you know, it's integrated into your actual physical classroom or it's offered as an alternative. So, you know, maybe there are a couple of classes you can take online, maybe the rest you take in person. You know, they're, they're experimenting with sort of different pieces around that. I do think, you know, we're seeing from a regulatory standpoint a real push towards supporting the community college system and towards alternate credentials. So hopefully we'll see some traction there because, again, I think employers recognize that for them to have sort of true diversity of workforce and to be able to sort of capture a lot of people that are really left behind, we need to kind of think a little creatively about how we're assessing qualified candidates. So, yes, I think a lot of things will stay the same just because people want to go back to the things the same. But then some things have been forced to change and they they're all going to change for the better. I agree. And and just to recap what I hear you saying, it, it is super exciting. You know, there have been positive things that have, have come out of the last year, right? So hybrid learning on the rise, employer ownership and of this responsibility to, to do more alternative credentialing. And then, of course, having this, even if it was forced at first, this mindset of agility and innovation, I feel like it will help universities and employers shift much quicker in the future when something's not quite working. That's right. And let's let's not forget sort of the idea of not being constrained by boundaries, right? One of the things that online learning really helps people do is access even particular courses before, you know, you would have to go and physically go to a university in Seattle or in Zimbabwe for a particular program. And, and you no longer have to do that. And so, you know, so for people who do want to travel the world and still do their degree, they can. So it opens up so many options for people and it really does simulate what we're seeing even in the workplace right now. Yeah, mobility 
I think is is underrated. And I, for one, feel like people who've gotten a taste of it and who understand what it's like to still be productive and in some cases even more productive when you have that flexibility, I don't think we're going back. So that's just my, my No, opinion. no. It's all like I said, it's all good. And it just gives people more options to just, you know, make it work for them. I mean, you know, it used to be that you had to just go and fit your life and education. And now you can just, you know, it, it can all work around you and what you want. It's great. That is great. Um, Asha, you know, going into education is, is very idealistic. And I'm curious about your journey into this space. Did tech bring you in or was it the idealistic side of you that brought you into ed tech? <laughs> so what's interesting is I actually don't come from the education world. Most of my career has been in consulting and market research and in that space, so I used to work for a variety of clients, you know, everyone from tech clients to finance to retail, but it was all around just understanding consumer behavior and how you can best communicate and build relationships with those consumers. And when I joined Pearson, um, this was my first time really kind of working on one client or, you know, on the client side. And for me, it was like, wow, how can you not talk about education in a compelling way? How can you not talk about it in an emotional way? How can you not build relationships? I mean, everyone feels something in their heart about education. So in a very different way than maybe you might feel about, you know, maybe a networking product or, or something. And so for me, it was like, wow, I feel like my job would be really easy and interesting to do. And imagine how wonderful it was to come in. And, you know, there's so many people at Pearson who come from education. And, you know, when you want to talk about a truly mission-driven organization, I mean, this is definitely one. And so, so you have people who are idealistic for sure, but they also know that it's good business because everyone needs education. So you can do, you can do both. You can do good and you can make money. It's great. That is great. And so do you have a lot of folks with teaching backgrounds within Pearson? Uh, that was going to be one of my questions for people who, who want to enter the the ed tech space, you know, what roles or, or pathways do you recommend to really make a difference? Well, the beauty of having people who come in who come from education is that they're also lifelong learners, right? So you may have come in, you may have been a teacher somewhere, but you're open to learning how to do marketing. You're open to learn how to do product development or even technology. And so what you find is you have people who come in who really know the space, who have relationships with universities and really the whole ecosystem that we need to have relationships with. But they also have the ability to learn and apply that towards our own business. And so what you find is you have people in our organization who actually move from function to function and help our business move forward in many different ways. And, you know, I'm a perfect example. I came in and I used to work in corporate affairs and now I'm working in product development in, in virtual learning. And again, it's, it's just, you know, to give people advice if they're interested in this, it really is about just being passionate about learning because you can't teach passion but then being open to learning new ways to apply that passion and, you know, figure out where your, where your credentials are, you know, if you're, if you're good in math or science or if you're good at communicating or whatever, and there will always be a place for you because this is a huge industry, you know, even beyond Pearson. Well, even at Pearson, I'm looking at your career site right now and you have 4,500, 4,501 jobs open around the world. So if anyone is interested in looking for a great job with a, with a great ed tech company, Pearson.jobs. Oh yeah. Yeah. We're, we're definitely, we're definitely growing and we see the space is growing in fascinating and wonderful ways. And, you know, we're going to continue to watch the market and just make sure that, you know, we're kind of moving along with it. So yes, definitely. People should definitely come check us out and apply. We, we need lots of help. Let's look into the future. And I know we, a lot of us are just looking back at the last year and looking immediately forward into how this next year can be different than last year. How about beyond that? What do you see or what are you dreaming up as far as what, what ed tech can do in society? So I think for us, you know, if we look at the direction of travel and if we look at 
sustainability goals at Pearson. Really, you know, our, our bigger mission in the world is, you know, we believe that education has the power to be the great equalizer. It's not right now because not everyone has equal access to education. And so for us, you know, we feel like technology has the potential to democratize it and equalize it in a way that then helps people achieve their dreams and their goals. And, you know, and so there's so much that can be done to then equalize it in that frame, you know, whether that's working with governments to equalize access to broadband and, you know, devices, whether that's, you know, reducing the cost of education or at least offering up more options for education so that it's not just about maybe, you know, a four-year degree. And then, you know, I think when you think about innovation in the context of technology, there's so much more that can be done to personalize education to like, you know, I mentioned a little bit about the clunkiness of, of education. Really, we should be able to move fluidly between the offline and online world in a way that we're not doing right now. You know, whether that's, you know, being able to learn on your device, but then being able to then go into a classroom and continue what you were doing on your device. And then really, you know, things like virtual reality kind of play a bigger role in terms of simulating labs, you know, artificial intelligence, definitely there's so much more that can be done to personalize experiences and actually help people through programs by almost anticipating what they need to be successful. So there's so much that can be done to personalize education, to make it more accessible in the next five years. And, you know, we've kind of just gotten started. How far away do you think we are from a VR personalized experience when it comes to, to education? That, <laughs> that's anyone's guess, really. I think no one had anticipated even this year that we would have moved as quick as we had. Because education, to a certain extent, can still be very traditional in the way we approach things. And, you know, there are certain things that we're reluctant to let go of you know, in terms of what we think constitutes the right sort of learning experiences that will result in mastery of certain subjects. So I think the way it will work is, and this is a lot of what we do in innovation, is you develop prototypes, you start to test them around, you see if they have legs, you test the efficacy of them to see whether they're really achieving the desired result. And then you just learn as you go along. So unfortunately, I don't have the answer for you when something will actually be ready. But all I can tell you is that for us, it's a real business imperative. And we're really focused on trying to bring these things sooner rather than later. As you know, technology just changes too, so quickly. You know, there could be something new in a year that we haven't even foreseen yet. That's the exciting part to me right now. And I feel like the energy of, of moving quickly and, and that people, like you said, have had to embrace technology have had to in order to continue working and learning, I think that will end up being a good thing to make life easier, hopefully in the future. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you have to, I mean, you have to, you can't wait till it's fully baked. You have to just constantly be just trying new things out and experimenting and, you know, potentially making some mistakes along the way. But that's the only way you can move quickly. Asha, how can listeners discover more about you and, and support what Pearson's doing in, in ed tech right now? Well, you know, I think it would be great. And, you know, we do tend to push things out on LinkedIn quite a bit. You know, we certainly have lots of research that we are conducting and pushing out around, you know, what's happening with employers, with consumers and, you know, how we can adjust. And of course, and I'm always happy for people to find me on LinkedIn. I try and share things too, not just things that we're doing at Pearson, but also things that our peers are doing. Because there's a lot of there's a lot of really amazing work going on in this space. And, you know, I think we can all share and learn from each other. Asha, thank you so much for being on the Girls in Tech podcast. This is such an important conversation to have. And everyone I can I can tell you is is excited to to see how technology is shifting and improving the way we can learn. So thank you. 
Thank you. And thank you so much for all the work that you do to highlight women's work in this space. Really appreciate it. Of course, women are doing so many amazing things. We have to highlight it so that we can inspire others to do more. I agree completely. Thank you. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Were you inspired by what you heard today? Head over to girlsintech.org to find more resources for starting and advancing a career in tech, including our jobs board and personal and professional development programs designed to help you excel. And be sure to tune in every week for new episodes. See you next time. The Girls in Tech podcast is a production of Girls in Tech and Podcast Network Solutions.